thank you for everybody for tuning in. We're going to go over Autodesk Fusion Generative uh, Design for Manufacturing. My name is Mike Fiedler, and with me is Apollo Vandenberg. We're both enterprise simulation specialists here at Autodesk, and we're going to be the host for today's presentation. Uh, so just to give you a, a heads up on what the agenda will be, we're going to discuss what is generative design um, for manufacturing. Uh, we will give you a brief demo. Once we're done with those items, we will talk about what your next steps might be if you want to learn more or have somebody from Autodesk reach out to provide some more information. And we're certainly going to leave time for question and answer, which is probably our favorite part of the, the whole entire presentation. Uh, give you an opportunity to ask any clarifying questions about either functions within the program itself or um, you know specifics about the next step. So I certainly encourage you when we get to that portion of the presentation to, to let us know any questions that you have and, and we'll do our best to, to answer any of them. Uh, as we get into talking about the program and introducing you to the program, what I think maybe is smart to start with is, you know, why might you care? Uh, obviously, everybody cares at least to some small extent, right? You're, you're here in the presentation, but uh, that could have been encouraged by somebody else, you know, take a look at this technology. It could have been your own, let me see a little bit about what this is about. Um, but we also think it's important uh, to uh, highlight that the, you know, the program is a, a functional program available from Autodesk. People are leveraging it now uh, in different industries. And so on the left-hand side there, you see the General Motors bracket, which you may have seen in some different publications. Um, and in that case, they took a multi-part assembly and they consolidated, consolidated it down using generative design into a single component. Um, at the same time, that allows them to optimize the, the assembly for mass uh, once we now have a single component. And then, of course, you can reduce the supply chain costs uh, because we're taking multiple parts and reducing them down to a, a single part. So, um, you know, potential reduction in the number of suppliers, certainly a reduction in the number of parts that need to be inventoried and, and stored somewhere. On the right-hand side, you see some generative design components on the wheelchair, and this was from a company called Disrupt Disability. Uh, and the idea there is to make the wheelchairs more versatile, to make them customizable and and almost a, a fashion item, if you will, you know, a unique design for the user of the wheelchair. And uh, some of the benefits there is that it's able to be tailored to a unique person's measurements. So as this person grows, you know, presuming that um, the, the disability starts out you know, at a younger age, then the components can be tailored for somebody that's, uh, you know, a, a lighter, smaller framed individual, and then, uh, be swapped out, you know, as the as the person grows, uh, and then you know interchangeable parts based on on needs and whether that is again something to do with uh, you know the, the the person growing or whether it has something to do with uh, change in in particular needs as far as how they're they're perhaps using the the chair. So uh, I guess in a nutshell, just note that you know they are these are just two stories. Uh, there are, are many more stories out there as well about how uh, different companies are leveraging the software today. Uh, so overall, what is the generative design uh, technology? It's, it's a design exploration technology, basically allowing you to simultaneously generate multiple CAD-ready solutions based on real-world manufacturing constraints and product performance requirements. And so basically what we're saying here is that you're going to get multiple CAD ready solutions, you know, based on the constraints that you input and based on the, the performance requirements that you input into the, into the program. And that's really the, one of the primary objectives, or I guess the overarching objective of the, the software, right? Um, when you normally start a task, uh, you begin with a sketch, and then from that sketch, maybe you extrude it, revolve, cut, uh, add fillets and features, 
really you're shaping what that design is based on you know the constraints that you have been given the idea with generative design is you input those constraints you input that product performance requirement or requirements and then the program generates numerous uh, results for you and then you can review those results and determine which one or two or three might best suit your needs all right, so how does it help in your product development process? We are going to show this timeline here, and you know, in a classic timeline, perhaps what you do is you start out with several different concepts, and those different concepts could be either you know thought of by you, or perhaps you get a small team of designers and engineers together and you come up with a number of different concepts. And then of course, you know, from those concepts, you're gonna take one and you're gonna validate it. And when you evaluate it, maybe it's, you know, difficult or expensive to manufacture. Uh, so you go back and you take a look at a different concept. And again, you go through this process uh, until you get one that's manufacturable and, and will suit the conditions. And then ultimately you're going to produce that one design, right? So you have a fairly lengthy iteration phase and you have a, a somewhat lengthy design to production phase. And that would be your classic, you know, start to finish process, development process. What we hope to do with generative design is upfront produce multiple validated manufacturing options. So you have a whole slew of different outputs that you can choose from and then you pick one of these designs and, and produce this, this result. And you can see this swing arm here on the right-hand side. So we go from potentially a multi-part assembly that was iterated upon till you get to the final design to having the program produce for you these multiple options uh, and thereby shortening both the iteration phase and the design to uh, production phase. So if we overlay that with the classic uh, methodology what you should see there then at the end of it all is a, a productivity increase right uh, getting multiple designs faster uh, and faster to production uh, to give an example of you know how the uh, generative design contrasts with something like topology optimization which you might be familiar with either from the, the simulation and the fusion or perhaps within Inventor, uh, we're gonna use some sort of transportation analogy. So uh, imagine that you're, the, the process of designing your part is equivalent to the shipping route, right? And you know how long it takes to get from uh, point A to point B. Uh, if you utilize topology optimization, what topology optimization does is basically makes a part lighter by ticking your existing geometry and figuring out from this existing geometry where can re we remove material. So, uh, you know, if we, we put this in terms of the shipping routes, it says, oh, okay, we can go through the, the Panama Canal. So that's a 60% faster uh, route, right? Uh, so that's basically what topology optimization does. It says, I took your geometry and I made your geometry 40% lighter. You still have essentially um, the same uh, shape that you had before. It's going to be the same material, of course. Uh, we're just going to make it lighter. On the other hand, uh, with the generative design process, we're gonna do that same thing, right? You can have a starting shape or you don't necessarily even have to have a starting shape. Uh, but if you do, it'll certainly figure out how we can make that lighter. But at the same time, it's also gonna give you different alternatives. You know, uh, Can we make this maybe by a 3D print? Can we use a milling machine? Uh, so there's different manufacturing methods involved as well. And at the same time, you can explore different materials. So in terms of transportation, you know, that would be the same as including, for instance, a truck route, a train route, and, and a plane route. So what you see there on the graph in the upper or towards the right-hand corner is that, you know, each one of these different methods is going to have different costs associated with them. They have different security associated with them, uh, how much cargo they can carry, 
and the speed with which they do it. So uh, likewise, whenever generative design outputs the results of these different methodologies of 3D printed versus uh, something that is, say, using a three axis versus a five axis milling process and the different materials, you're going to have different costs associated with them and, and different manufacturing speeds associated to them. Uh, with our next slide here, uh, as we put this presentation together uh, at, at a more granular level, Apollo and I were thinking, well, what's the, the primary reasons that somebody might utilize generative design overall? And one would be new product design creation. And that's where, you know, maybe you're coming face-to-face uh, -face with a, a brand new product uh, and you don't really have at this point any constraints uh, on how that might be manufactured or necessarily what that, you know, completely looks like, but you know where it might need to be constrained, you know what sort of loads it might need to carry. Uh, and in that case, you can certainly utilize generative design to, to ideate uh, what that geometry is going to look like. And the second thing would be cart, part consolidation. So maybe you currently have a multi-part assembly and, and what you want to do is reduce that down to uh, a single part. Uh, so that you have less parts to worry about and, and inventory. So it can also be utilized for that. And then a, a third reason that you might use it is because you have some existing geometry and you want to see, you know, perhaps how do we lightweight this? You know, what might it look like uh, if we say that we're going to 3D print it or we're going to use a different manufacturing methodology? So it could be any one of those three or even a combination of those three. And then ultimately, you know, given the, the utilization of the program, your goal, of course, is to strike the right balance between the, the performance and the cost to produce. So we know that engineers are limited in the time and energy that they can spend on any design. And of course, that's certainly where generative design is going to help out by producing multiple designs. All right. And then once you have all these different outputs, then of course, uh, your objective is to balance the cost to produce with the performance of the particular outcome. So we're going to take a look at this in a, in a hypothetical situation. If we lay out all these different outcomes that you get from generative design, uh, at the one end of the spectrum, some of them might be lower cost, lower performance. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, your high cost, high performance options. So you know, again, to use a transportation analogy, if we take a look at some different vehicles here, uh, certainly these three different vehicles are going to have different costs associated with them in order to purchase them. Uh, as far as their performance is concerned, you know, if we just fundamentally consider, am I able to go from point A to point B? Uh, yes, uh, they should all be able to do that, but you know, how you get there and at what speed, uh, what the experience is for the user, these are all going to be, you know, slightly different. So to put it more in terms of, you know, a, a engineering component, uh, this is a, a bracket that was a component that was put forth by GE Aerospace some years ago. And basically what they asked was for input from the user community. You know, if you were designing this part, and you know they provided this as a starting shape and said this is where the constraints need to go uh, within the four bolt holes and then they provided different loads that needed to go on to the two lugs you know vertical forces horizontal forces moments you know how would you design this this geometry and the user community delivered <laughs> there was many many users over you know some span of time however this challenge was open a month or two months and they produced a lot of different designs. And it took, again, many designers a lot of different hours. Uh, and our intent with the generative design software is that we could produce a similar number of outputs, right, with one engineer, right? You as the designer or as the engineer are going to take this one design perhaps as your starting point or even just some parts of this design you could start with where your constraints are where your loads are uh, as preserve regions you can put in your your avoidance regions which apollo will cover here very shortly and then the program is going to output for you a bunch of different designs and then again based on 
what best suits your needs. You can determine which ones you want to uh, proceed with um, investigating further. All right, in this slide here, uh, we just want to show that it's not necessarily restricted to uh, brackets in a manufacturing environment, right? Uh, we see the ability to utilize generative design for, for different uh, industries. So in the top left-hand side, you can see something like uh, consumer products. And then in the towards the right-hand side of that, perhaps, yes, some more uh, manufacturing industry-related uh, designs the swing arm of the motorcycle, uh, the the braking system there, uh, but then also things like industrial design. So if you look at the the bottom row there, you see the housing to the light there, uh, and towards the right hand side there, uh, perhaps some sort of uh, shelving system bracket. So it could also be more for towards the aesthetic end than just a a, a light weighting type of uh, uh, process or, or practice that you might go through for, for a typical manufacturing design. All right. So once you put in all the information to the program, where is this thing fixed or held? Uh, what are the materials that I'm going to utilize? What are the different manufacturing methods that I'd like to be able to potentially utilize? Uh, this is a snapshot of what you might get out of generative design. And you can see the plot here with all the different dots. So the different colored dots represent the different materials that they chose to explore. So three different materials, right? And then a number of different manufacturing methods. And these are all plotted out. And we can see that what we're looking at here is maximum displacement versus the mass. Um, so that's the idea with generative design. It gives you numerous outputs. And then with these different outputs, you can pick different ones that you want to investigate further. So uh, let me step through a little bit what the workflow looks like before I go into a, a short demo showing some of the clicks and picks. Um, so this kind of follows into what Mike was highlighting as maybe that, that third bucket, you know, the part enhancement. So you know, we, we have a CAD model, we have a, technically we're going to look at the kind of suspension, you know, A-arm, um, and, and we're going to try to see, you know, could we make this out of other materials? And if so, you know, what would that look like? How would that be manufacturable? You know, would that yield us any savings in terms of weight or, or cost? Um, so from that CAD model, you know, we'll project geometries. Uh, so there, there will be a need to to have some pieces of geometry where we're going to assign the different loads for for you know braking, acceleration, maybe the, the weight of the car, um, and then we have a, a avoidance regions. So uh, where we don't want any geometry to be built. So the suspension has to have some range of mobility um, that that we need to keep clear. We might need access to uh, to making you know putting in hardware like bolts. Um, we need access for the tools to get to those bolts and mounting hardware. So, so all of that needs to be projected and then defined, um, you know, including those, those load cases for, for what we're looking to, to represent. Um, after that, we go into generate and, and let generative design, you know, produce all of those outcomes based on those manufacturing methods that you're interested in and all the materials. And then finally, you know, exploring it kind of as Mike mentioned, you know, looking at it in, in a couple of different ways. Um, so we'll go ahead and step through here. You know, so this is the, the A arm that we're going to look at, you know, in generative design. Uh, we're going to take this from the design space to the generative space. Um, here we can actually make unique edits to the model so it doesn't impact the, you know, actual production model and project a number of features. So these will be all of our preserves where we're going to assign the different loads and, and constraints. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we need some, some sort of preserve. So, you know, this suspension has to rotate. You know, there might be some frame members in here. Um, we you know, might need uh, some, as well, some avoidance regions for the mounting hardware that would go, you know, around the bushings, uh, getting those bolts and whatnot. So once we have all of that built and projected, then we can go in and start actually defining this space. 
So, you know, picking those preserve regions, those that we want to keep, we can select them and as we assign them, they'll show up as green. You know, in this case, we don't have a starting shape. So pretty much everything else that we have built is uh, an avoidance region. Uh, we don't want any geometry built in it. But if we wanted to, we could leverage the existing design as a starting shape. Um, and then from there, we want to build out all the different load cases. So, you know, where are we constraining, you know, the suspension? What are the different forces or moments acting on, on them in what orientations? And we can have, you know, a number of different load cases. Um, after that, we go into our objectives. So, you know, what are we striving for? Are we trying to minimize mass, maximize stiffness? You know, what's the safety factor we're looking for? Uh, and then what are those manufacturing methods that we're interested in, uh, you know, looking at? Is it three axis or five axis? Um, you know, since I've gone through making this, this video kind of highlighting the workflow, we've also added die casting and two axis cutting, um, you know, what materials do we want to look at? So maybe this has traditionally been a steel component. You know, maybe we want to look at aluminum or some other metals, you know, that could be either printed or, or uh, you know, CNC'd and uh, see if, if there is benefit to, to switching what we've been doing. Uh, we can go into make sure that the pre-check has everything in order and then generate all of our outcomes. So as we get our outcomes, you know, we have all the thumbnail images there on the left hand side. We can isolate and filter based on the manufacturing method to see what they look like. We can filter based on, you know, mass or displacement, you know, different criteria and outputs um, to see which ones meet what we're looking for. We can look at it in tabular form, uh, you know, if that, that makes sense. Um, I'd say a lot of people tend to jump more so into that graph that, that Mike was showing. So here we can choose the X and Y axis. Uh, and, and so we could see, hey, this corner here, which is looking at you know, low mass and low displacement, maybe is of interest to us. All of those are, are you know, orange ones are one material. This blue one is a different material. So you know, let's take those two and compare them and see how they, they appear, you know, depending on uh, um, you know, how, how they behaved. So in the compare, we can also look at, you know, the design space. So, uh, you know, we can look at the stresses that are on the model. We can bring back those preserves and, and obstacle regions to see, um, you know, where they were. We can look at those specifics as far as what the factor of safety was that was achieved, what the displacement was, you know, globally through the model. Um, and then once we have one that we like, we can actually promote this back into uh, design and fusion. Um, at which point we can either use it as is, or if we wanted to do further validation, we could take that into, um, into fusion simulation where we'll actually carry over all of those load cases into, uh, into a, a preset you know, simulation. So here just kind of re-assembling re, uh, it into the, uh, the suspension itself. So that's just kind of at a high level, you know, uh, the workflow, what it looks like, how how we can leverage it. Um, you know, realistically, you know, as a as a high level, you know, that's kind of what we're trying to cover. Get your feet wet into it. You know, ultimately, people kind of ask, well, what's next? You know, how do I how do I dive into it? Maybe you've got a project in mind where this could be used. Um, what I'd say is so at the end of this webinar, as soon as we close out, there will be a short three question survey. Uh, one of those questions is if you're interested in us reaching out to you um, and having a further discussion perhaps around around that project, um, you know, or, or maybe you have more specific questions than what you're willing to share here, you know, to, to the audience at large. Um, we're happy to dive in deeper. Um, so just feel free to, you know, to answer that question accordingly. Uh, and then one of the other questions is just, you know, um, yeah, we're always looking for feedback on these webinars. Did this, you know, kind of meet your meet your expectations for what you're you were looking for and what drove you to this webinar versus, you know, maybe some others. Um, so, you know, with that, what I'll, I'll say is, uh, you know, we can we can kick open Fusion here on our side and you know, bring open a, a model in case there are specific questions, uh, but we'll go ahead and open it up. So if you do have a question in, 
in GoToWebinar, you can use the questions panel, uh, or if you'd like to talk out loud, feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but yeah, the remaining time is is for you guys. And um, yeah, any any questions you'd like to dive in deeper with? Okay, uh, so we do have a question, and, and somebody said, what's the general cost for one case study? If there is only one iteration of a design, this is a cloud credit-based feature, uh, correct? Uh, so you are correct, and that was something that I had in my head while uh, Apollo was going through that, um, uh, through that demonstration, and he showed going to different materials, and 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 load cases uh what i was going to say is is right it is cloud credit based right the the number of cloud credits is based on um running the the simulation is that the right way to, to which is that how you would put it um so the number of materials that you assign to it the number of manufacturing methods that you assign to it um what other variables am I missing? Um, uh, load, cases. load cases. Those are all for, well, I don't want to say for free, but it's all in that, that token charge, right? Um, so if you choose one material and say, give me uh, the result of a, a three axis mill in the Y direction, it's the same charge as if you said, show me these five different materials and these four different manufacturing methods. Uh, so you, you know, if those are a possibility for you, um, if you say I have, you know, these three different materials I, I'm willing to consider and I have these X number of different manufacturing methods that we are able to consider, then I would go ahead and include them all in the analysis so that you get, you know, a larger number of uh, outputs to, to explore, right? Um, so then you're only charged for that, that token rate once. Uh, and, and you get a wider range of outputs, which are potential solutions uh, for you to manufacture. Yeah, so it kind of in short, it is a flat fee with no additional cost if you add more materials or more manufacturing methods. All right, we do have one hand raised. Um, uh, uh, as a follow-up, the flat fee, it's one flat fee per uh, submission. So if you submit, you know, for, for design one per se, you go and, and submit the job to the cloud to run, um, whether you had one material or, you know, 10 materials, it's the same cost. Um, now, if you, you know, after looking at the, those results, you decide you want to make a change or you want to include additional load cases and you go to submit it again, um, every time you click that generate button to, to generate outcomes, that's where the, the charge happens. And you'll be presented with that up front. So, you know, you won't, uh, it won't just start solving and, and charging without your, your knowledge. Right. And I think that, um, you know, we should also maybe differentiate a little bit between uh, load cases and different studies, right? Um, so when you are doing a model, let's say that we take the, either the suspension or you could even consider the, the GE aerospace bracket. And I, I don't want to get too, uh, maybe we don't want to get too, <laughs> too deep and confuse people here, but you know, you could say I have forces in the, uh, positive X direction. It needs to withstand a load of a hundred pounds force, right? But then you probably also maybe have forces in the minus X direction too. You wouldn't necessarily want to put them on the same load case because they would negate each other. So you would have a, a positive 100 pound force say in the, in the positive X direction and then maybe you have a minus 100 pounds force in the minus X direction. You would separate those into load case one and load case two. 
So as it iterates through what this design needs to be to withstand those forces, um, uh, it will compensate the design for both your positive x direction and your minus x direction as, as they are separate load cases. Those are not separate charges because they are they are still within the one submission, the one analysis. It's just considering, you know, as it defines the geometry, what the geometry needs to be. I need to withstand the loads in load case one plus the loads in load case two plus whatever loads are in load case three. So you can set up multiple load cases and and uh, it'll consider those in its in its outcome. Uh, it would only be when you set up a completely different uh, design submission, if you will. No. Yeah, that's a it's a good question. Um, so another one is, uh, you know, what is what is or are some of the limitations uh, of generative design? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, some of those limitations, you could say that we're, you know, when we when we run those simulations, we are looking at um, you know, linear static stresses. Uh, so if you're getting into components that maybe are uh, experiencing nonlinearities, um, you know, that's where we have that workflow that uh, I was kind of alluding to where, you know, once you take a design that you like, you can promote it back into Fusion um, so that you could leverage, say, Fusion simulation to, to look at, you know, some of the nonlinear aspects of uh, of the behavior of that part. Um, so, you know, I'd say that that's probably, you know, uh, one of the limitations. Um, in other cases, it could be, uh, you know, maybe some of the loads and constraints that we have today. Um, you know, there are, are asks, you know, all the time for, for being able to assign, you know, more or, or different uh, loads to the model to, so that people can be more you know, more accurate in what their component is experiencing, um, as well as additional manufacturing methods. So, you know, we release uh, an update, you know, almost every two weeks with, uh, with Fusion. And, um, you know, just in the past, I don't know, month and a half to two months, we've, you know, added in like three different manufacturing methods, you know, based on feedback and, and based on the community at large, you know, looking to have more than than what we had initially. Um, so, you know, th those would be the big ones. I'd say if there's something, you know, more specific that you're, you know, looking to understand around its limitations, you know, it might be best to ask it in in context to, uh, you know, a, a, a part or or a model or you know what what you're looking to to do with it. Um, Yeah, that, that's one question that normally comes up as well to expand or add uh, something adjacent to what Apollo just said there. We, we do usually get some questions about uh, analyses of the geometry, whether it's uh, for vibrations or nonlinear or thermal. And uh, when he exported or showed the, the export of that geometry, you know, you're, you're back in the design space. Um, we would certainly love it if you stayed within Fusion. Fusion simulation uh, does have, you know, a number of different analysis capabilities, including thermal and nonlinear um, and some vibration. But given that you are in the design space now with your geometry, uh, you know, you could certainly export that uh, as some type of universal file and, and, and take that if you have a another FEA package of preference. Um, I don't know, inventor Nastran. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep it in the Autodesk family. But yes, you can you, you can certainly export it there, I would I would add uh, as well. Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll jump to this one here. Can I use generative design on single parts? How about multi-bodies or assemblies? Um, you know, so at this stage, yeah, I mean what we are focusing on um, you know, we'll say a, a single part, right? You know, as as Mike presented or showed. You know that part could be uh, the the consolidation of of a prior subassembly um, or or multiple parts, multiple bodies that existed. But you know the net output that we're we're generating is a single body, and um, you know what we're kind of bringing in, and even in terms of loading, as you kind of saw, is uh, is from that single part. 
mentality. So we have those preserves that are our unique portions of what will become that final part. Um, that is one of the, the things that I'd say I've heard probably the most is, you know, perhaps trying to bring in a full assembly so that somebody could assign the loads to other parts of that assembly and just have, you know, say like in this the, the model that I went through, the suspension A arm, you know, perhaps bringing in everything from the chassis to the wheel and so that you could assign forces at the wheel and at the chassis and have those transmit them accordingly to the A arm. Um, at this stage, you know, you would have to do the math uh, into what that A arm should be experiencing for those different load cases um, and, and kind of get your output. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, if you're okay with the output, so uh, hypothetic, I don't know why you would, but let's say that that, just as a reminder, if that A arm were uh, currently, I don't know, two, three components that were bolted together or, you know, at some point assembled together, um, yes, you could certainly take those three or however many components now uh, and join them into, I mean, generative design is going to come out with its output will be a single component, right? So that's that goes back to what we were talking about, about consolidating assemblies into a, a single component. So if it's a matter of, you know, you have a four-part assembly that is currently either bolted together or welded together so that it makes a cohesive unit, and you're looking to see if the program can, you know, given your constraints and, and loads, consolidate that into a single body and what that would look like. Uh, so that is certainly within the realm uh, of the program. Okay. Uh, one of the other questions here is, you know, as a smaller company that might not have all the resources to produce multiple case studies per project, you know, how do we utilize the software? It's a great design interface but is it cost effective going through credits while trying to manage the learning curve? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, it gets into a little bit more specifics, uh, I'd say around, you know, perhaps your company. Um, you know, when people do sign up uh, with uh, different entitlements, you know, there, it's not uncommon that there are uh, a small pool of, of cloud credits that are available. Uh, to kind of get started. Uh, but beyond that, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're getting into and, you know, the the realization of the what Mike was showing that, you know, time to market. Um, you know, if you look at your traditional methods that you have been doing before, you know, how many different designs were you able to to get in a given time frame and, and how many were you able to validate um, you know, if, if you if you had a goal of always trying to, you know, look for three alternatives, then, you know, the, the overhead charge uh, that you were experiencing in saving man hours, you know, might easily offset, you know, the, the nominal fee of just submitting, you know, submitting the simulation to the cloud. Um, so, you know, the, the, the act of solving it is is the cheaper part, you know, of being able to kind of get the insight and look at where geometry um, is required, and uh, you know, from there you can always kind of use that as a as a baseline to then design your own part, kind of in that that ID8 bucket that that Mike was showing. Yeah, as far as uh, some learning tools, um, you know, to get started. So it's a, uh, you know, there are a couple different couple different paths. Um, you know, one is uh, probably in, in the last month, we've uh, updated, you know, Fusion to actually have a guided learning path built into the tool. And so you can definitely take advantage of that and that'll walk you through, you know, some of the, the requirements. Uh, we also have uh, the Fusion 360 Academy online, which uh, has a bunch of content on learning all things fusion so it, it goes into you know modeling and to t-splines um, but they do have a nice section uh, posted there as well for for generative um, and kind of getting getting you up to speed with a, a couple tutorials one of which I actually think is the that GE bracket that that we were talking around um, 
so so those would probably be you know for for the masses i'd say you know my starting point to to learn it yeah and i i don't think that um i don't think that our attendees here are off the mark right um there is a you know it's a it's a token based or, or cloud credit based consumption model. Uh, I could understand that you don't want to just be throwing your cloud credits around uh, wastefully, and, and I would wholeheartedly agree with Apollo um, that it probably makes sense. You know, there, like he said, there's different layers of um, resources available, including the, the tutorials and the, the online academy. It probably makes sense to go through a uh, some sort of guide to begin with to, to kind of nail down the process. I think both of us, when we, we started with the program, um, you know, as, as designers and engineers, we kind of were envisioning things in our head about what that outcome looks like, right? So it's, it's somewhat easy to uh, think about what that final shape might need to look like. Uh, and maybe what we forget about is uh the obstructions right the regions that we we don't want it to build in since you're giving the program the ability to construct what that geometry looks like i think maybe that is is one of the things that you, you get used to uh but maybe is uh not something you think of right out of the gate so so going through a a tutorial or you know watching some some learning content uh helps helps develop that mindset and then it doesn't take too long uh, I think afterwards to develop, you you make that mistake once or twice and, and wait for the outcomes and go, oh, shoot, you know, it, it built where I, I don't want it to have, have built. And, and uh, now I need to go back and make some obstructions. Yeah. And, and some of that we are, you know, we're taking as as people step through it um, and, you know, changing the product even. Right. So, you know, when when we started with this, you know, we had to you know, specifically build every obstacle region that, that Mike's referring to um, or avoidance region where we don't want geometry. But, you know, there are some commonalities in, in how people build geometry. And so, you know, now there is the ability, you know, with like a, a there's a button um, that allows you to pick a hole and, and kind of automatically create, you know, a bolt for, for an avoidance region, you know, kind of referencing that there will be mounting hardware there um, so kind of keeping that at the forefront, you know, in your face that, you know, you need to think mm -hmm. about this. Um, but, but even then at times, you know, it's not always even taking into account, say, tool access, right? So if you had a couple different uh, bolts, you know, uh, throughout the geometry, like, can you get a wrench to that, to that bolt or can you get a socket there? Um, you know, how are you going to actually fix that bolt to, you know, through the hole itself? You know, is the bolt too long to to snake through you know to get to that to that mounting location so you know some of those are the we'll say the change in in you know mentality that you'll start to to come across as you go through you know reading some of the the, the documentation and kind of going through those tutorials Uh, so lastly, is it possible to program prerequisites such as minimum value of CD generated in the design? So if you're if you're referencing the CD as far as like a drag coefficient, you know, at this stage, um, you know, I'd say maybe that goes back into the prior question of you know limitations. You know, we're not looking at fluid flow. Um, so if you're trying to, you know, again, if we're looking at that A arm and we were, this was for a performance vehicle and we wanted to have, you know, minimized drag of that suspension component. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, we'll say, uh, fluid solid interactions, right? We're not doing FSI and in, in seeing, you know, how airflow goes over this component and, and then extracting out to, you know, minimize or maximize a given um, output from that fluid side. You know, purely at this stage, you know, this is a, a structural, um, you know, structural solver, you know, it's doing structural analysis. Um, and, and so, yeah, there isn't anything, A, on the fluid side that we can do. Um, it, it is something that we are looking at and, you know, looking further into um, to understand, you know, what would be needed and 
what what the ask from the industry is around that. Um, outside of that, from a structural side, uh, you know what we kind of went through, and you know again, there's always more being added as far as you know the objectives, um, you know for for the analysis. So you know, are we are we trying to maximize stiffness? Are we looking for a specific factor of safety? Um, you know, moving forward, you know, we've actually added in uh, costing details with uh, our partnership with a priori to understand like what's what's the range of cost to manufacture, you know, that given part based on that manufacturing method and that material. So, you know, to get that now there's, excuse me, there's even uh, an input for, um, you know, what's the quantity that you'd be looking to manufacture so that we can kind of get a better approximation there. Um, outside of those, there isn't a way to, you know, uh, pre-program it in. Um, you're, you're kind of setting it up as, as you go through it each time. Is there a possibility to optimize the iteration of generative design for 3D printing? So yes, uh, we have it listed as additive manufacturing. Um, that is the manufacturing constraint that you would enable from a 3D printing perspective. Uh, you have a few details that you can specify there. So uh, namely being like the overhang angle. Um, so if, if you know that your printer can print up to a certain, you know, angle, you can specify that. And then, you know, by default, we, we will print in the positive X, positive Y, and positive Z directions. Um, so kind of building off the platform in those, those three orientations. So if I, you know, uh, if you want real quick, I can kind of highlight that real quick with this, with the video for a second. Um, jump ahead. So towards, towards the end here, um, I'll, I'll let this play out again. You know, there were a couple where, where this, you know, given the orientation of this A arm, you know, when we did our additive print, it was assuming that we were flat on the print bed, and then we printed, you know, vertically in the, in this case, it was, you know, in the Z direction to, uh, to get that geometry. Um, you don't have the, if you want to change the uh, relative orientation, so if you're looking at, you know, orienting this part for additive, you might have to um, change that location in your model prior to generating the outcome. So if you wanted to come, you know, have like a self-supporting structure that was at some obscure angle relative to the to the planes, you would have to to set that up in the in the setup process. But that's a, a good crap uh, a good question. So any any other questions while I wait for this video just to get to to that point just to highlight the you know the additive outputs that we were we were showing. Yeah, so here, just to kind of go back to it, so here during the setup process, this is where you're picking, you know, those manufacturing methods. You know, when I did this video, I need to go back and update it to include now the die casting and, you know, two axis cutting. But, you know, this is where you're specifying, you know, what the minimum thickness is for your parts, you know, that you can print and, and what the overhang angle is. Um, so as you, as you include this, you know, we will, again, by default, assume uh, we're going to do three outputs for additive in in the positive x, y, and and z directions from the uh, the build plane.
Okay, and so here you can kind of see this is um, this this one here is uh, the additive or one of the additive solutions. So kind of coming off of the build plane, you know, we're trying to maintain a self-supporting, you know, additive geometry, and and so we're kind of filling it filling it in to ensure that it's self-supporting and connecting to the appropriate, you know, preserve regions. Um, so since I had a, you know, there were a couple of different materials from an additive perspective, you get a couple different outcomes that are very similar, but maybe a little bit different based on those material properties. Let me see, I think there's another, yeah, that was the, probably the best image of it right there. So, so yeah. That hopefully that, that answers your question around optimizing for 3D printing. All right, well, if there are no other questions, um, you know, we'll go ahead and close it out. Like I said, you know, if you'd like to dive in deeper, if you'd like to have a further discussion right at the end of this, as we end the webinar, there will be a, a quick survey asking you if you'd like us to reach out. Feel free to answer yes. If you answer no, um, thank you for joining. And hopefully we, we, you know, answered any questions that you might have had around gender design. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Good discussion.